Live. All right, so uh, Richard is hopping on, which I'm very excited about because he's very smart. Anytime I get to learn from smart people, it's always a win. Uh, so I'll postpone the uh, ex- the uh, beginning of the conversation, but as always, I will strip the oh, there it is. Um, I'll strip the audio. How do I add and put it to a podcast? How did I pronounce his last name? But Richard lives in Amsterdam, which is in Europe, which is a fancy continent. Richard, Richard. how's it going, my man? Good. Okay. Let me see. Can you hear me well? Does it sound like it's coming through? It sounds good to me. Yeah. Do I sound good? You sound you sound just as good as you look. <laughs> Which isn't fan. It's you look like uh, Clark Kent. If no one's ever told you, you know who Superman is. Listen, bro. I tried to get the role for Superman in this last movie. My sister in law literally went to the the casting directors and tried to get me in there. Um, I have no acting experience, where I was like, I get told at least twice a week, and not trying to be cocky or anything. At least twice a week, I get st- like flagged down for being Superman. Well, Clark I can't ask. <laughs> I mean, I, it's it's uncanny. I mean, both with the perfect hair and the the, the swoop and the the jawline and the eye, it's it's unbelievable. It's <laughs> um, what is your so? There's two questions to start off. Uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, but I'm gonna harass you first. How do you pronounce your last name? Because I tried 15 different ways and I can't seem to really settle on a place that feels makes me feel happy. Yes, a Sevis. A Sevis. Okay, that's why we never got yeah. it. A Cavs, Aces, Aces, Vs, Sevis. Okay, and then what's your prescription? What do you? What, what's your glasses like? So I was told, see, because now I'm Superman, so that's the problem. Is I have to wear them so I can stay normal and not be a god from Actually, outside oh. of this world. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. Um, anywho, um, no. So I was told by my wife like four years ago that I was blind, and I was like, I'm not blind. Definitely not blind. I was a little bit blind, so I can't see far away. It's like, um, I don't know what it's even called. Yeah, I literally just showed up somewhere. They told me I needed glasses. I said, cool. And then I put the glasses on. People said, you look smarter and you look better looking. And I was like, sold. Which ones should I buy? I'm a simple human being at the end of the day. (laughs) See, when I got glasses at the age of two, people just called me four eyes and made fun of me. So, But I guess that's the difference when you're farsighted. It's hypermetropic. You... uh, (laughs) They just magnify your glasses as opposed to making them look smaller. So, right, you know, it, it wasn't fun. It um, but interesting. So, <laughs> I've been doing a, a lot of reading and research about eyesight. Um, I, I wear contacts and glasses most days, but there's a whole lot more than meets the eye. Meets the eye. What a great pun intended. Anyways, um, yeah. but we can talk about that more uh, because most importantly, you're going to be coming out to here in December. So, I said yes. Sacramento area. Um, We'll, we'll kind of cover more about that, but just as a heads up to the spoiler, this is leading up to what will be three months, almost exactly. I think we're the fourth today. So yeah, three months uh, or two months, because I can't do my math. November, December. Yeah. Yeah, two months today, we'll be doing live seminars and that'll be a very, very cool experience. I'm excited so, for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited. So um, for people who might not know who Rare Barracuda is, um, Third question: Where does Rare Bear, Bear your uh, Instagram handle? Where does Rare Barracuda come from? Other than oh, a hard thing to say. So I was the, uh, I came into Instagram like very OG days, um, but that means that I also came into Instagram when I was I started with like CrossFit as my kind of fitness route, uh, um, and I was trying all the cool CrossFit names, and they were all taken. And I was what, what are what are cool CrossFit names? Oh, back in the day, you had like Swad Killer, so Strength Workout of the Day Killer. Oh my um, gosh! Okay. What, yeah, <laughs> there was all kinds of. <laughs> Let's not go into what was cool back then, um, but yeah. So I was in a. I went to Cozumel for a trip, and we were snorkeling, and I saw a big ass barracuda. Um, and when I was trying to think of names, I just for some reason that barracuda popped up in my head. I was like, that was a rare barracuda. I kind of like, I liked how it sounded off the tongue. But I was like, rare barracuda it is. And it wasn't taken. So I kept it. And it's turned out to be a pretty cool story. Because now if you go back and read like the spiritual animal of the, bar- rare, of the barracuda, 
Um, it's somebody that takes you along a wild side into a wild trip. And it's somebody that is going to show you what you need, but not what you want to hear. Mm. Um, it's somebody that is there to fight alongside you, but you're still a lone predator. So you, for a lot of, it's, it's interesting how it plays a big role into the clients that I work with, uh, kind of like my niche clientele. Yeah. Um, and it plays along well with who I am as a coach because I'm not, I don't think I'm the, you know, regular, not that there's That's a sure. regular coach, but you know what I mean? Like, is, I, I do things, a little, I, do, I do things, I do things my way. Um, you know, if we're going to work together and if you drink obviously and everything, but I enjoy the craftsmanships of good food and good drinks. So mm. we're going to go have a nice whiskey. We're going to discuss a good whiskey. We're going to go have some nice wine. Mm. We're going to have a great night. And then the next morning we're still going to train hard and have a great time. So I, I, I take people definitely on a wild side and I allow people to see their truest versions of themselves. Yeah. So I think at full circle, it kind of plays well. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's uh. Um, and you were very gracious. I, I was dealing, uh, have been dealing with a, like a neck nerve thing in the last six weeks. And you were very gracious to, uh, let me hop in and see some of your, your coursework, course material, which is incredibly detailed and well, well presented just as a, an overview of the, the body. And there, I could definitely see the, so it just makes me even more excited to ask a lot of the questions. Yeah. Um, I, as an aside, as an aside, as a side note, the, I'm always interested about this like subconscious thing that pops up that tends to have some bearing in life. Like why, you know, in some capacity, you just, if you put out, I have an, a question I'm thinking about, let me just, I don't know, like think it broadly, meaning I just I, like put it out to the universe, however you want to say that, but it's like, oh, that's just this thing. What should I name myself? And then you have an experience that's of all the experiences you've had in Cosmel since that uh, seems to stick out to you. And then it's like, you kind of then you find out that and maybe we go maybe we're backwards meaning making we post hoc meaning making machines or just like we're actually connecting to something greater who knows but it's really cool i'm always interested like how that tends to work out in in a way that wouldn't seem obvious you know yeah and i mean I, this is a i would say a deeper question towards determinism or free will right <laughs> I think about that all um, the time, literally all the time. It's like, you know, because you, you, on one hand, you want to say, we have all this free will, we can do whatever. On the other hand, it's like, you know, go with the flow. It's like, which one is it, you know? Slightly predetermined. There's, there's feedback loops. And I think that the, you know, when we talked about, you know, you having some shoulder issues, things like that, um, this is where my specialty and, and something I've been trying to figure out. So outside of Cozumel, I had a rock climbing accident. Uh, that affected my left hip and it allowed me to have a different perspective of life and it's always more of a it's the like the what came first the chicken or the egg type conversation but it's a it's this it's their feedback loops right so am i feeling discomfort because of this behavioral trait or because of this reactive mechanism or do i have this reactive mechanism because of this discomfort or where i hold stress that's been my my question that I keep going back and forth, and there is no right answer. It's their feedback loops. So that's why when you look at, um, you know, we, we talk about sprinting. If you look at sprinters or long distance runners, they have a certain personality type. Like you can mm -hmm. almost pick them out. If you see a crossfitter, you can pick them out. If you see a power lifter, you can pick them out. Well, if you see a well, rugby player, will tell you about it too. That's, that's the <laughs> nice before the vegans. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but they, they're, it's a feedback loop because you're essentially training the same movement patterns so that you create the same imbalances in the body, the same muscles turn on and turn off. And that's what I've, what I've been working on is how do the muscles hold information that end up becoming part of who you are, part of your identity. Mm, yeah. And that's been sort of my my quest forward is okay so we have trauma there's a difference between the trauma the event that happened versus the story that you start to have of that trauma or that event um and that starts to create the identity of who you are but that event also forced certain muscles to turn on and turn off and this will be something that you can have a conversation with uh with dr ed who's uh, an amazing doctor that i'm working with to try and hmm. proof all of my concepts but essentially it's uh, the cell danger response, right? So it's interesting that when stress comes into the body, the cells can communicate and it's 
interesting because the perception now as you start to look more into muscles and how they start to communicate and turn on or turn off and i know that most you know geek heads would be like well you don't turn off the muscle the neural capacity of the muscle turns down mm -hmm. right so there's less neural capacity less active contraction of the muscle starts to turn down and so there's a big correlation from behavioral traits meaning how you react to certain stressful situations and where you hold stress or where you hold pain and discomfort in the body and it's um you know for for my whole journey it's 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 been interesting where i could be in the gym and i start to talk to somebody about where they're having pains and aches and i can speak to them without knowing who they are what their background is or anything and i can talk to them about where they are right now and the traumas that they've kind of gone through or or more importantly how they've perceived the traumas mm -hmm. to create their current identity or i can be out at a bar having a great time at two o'clock in the morning hanging out and then there's always that one person goes oh can you read me and i just start having a conversation with them and i can tell you where they're holding pain in their body yeah and and well, i'm not i would say i'm batting close to 100. yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's and just and you try to tell me if this is inaccurate but when when i try to describe this kind of phenomenology because at first people lump this into like psychics and spirit reading and, and like this kind of like overly overtly spiritual side and i do think that once you understand that like spiritual just refers to anything that pers like is is beyond the, the it's like between the material in a sense like you know this concept is like something that isn't explained by just a material like oh well this is you know this is cotton because it's the plant fiber right. put together there if you look at a dog and you see you scare a dog it's very clear that they just they 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 act they act out their emotion like their their psychology if you can call it that acts if it, it expresses itself immediately through their physiology or their body and so there's no question you see a dog Oh, that's a scared dog. Right. Oh, that's a happy dog. And it's like, so we obviously express our emotion. We, we make shapes based off of the internal experience we have. What you were talking about is just a step beyond that, which is, is simply like your body is making the obvious presentation of this. Right. I'm just and, saying with patterns based on what I see. Is that accurate? Would you, would you say? Yeah. It, yeah. And, and the, the biggest thing is I, I try to walk away away from as much of the spirituality side mm -hmm. of things. Cause I always mm -hmm. see, and this is a pattern that I've seen with coaches. So for me, it's like, I try to keep it more on, okay, so let's keep it more science related. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, the human is here to try and survive and reproduce, right? We can have different conversations about it. But for the most part, we should be here as 99% of the animals here that want to reproduce, want to pass on genetics and information. So the trauma or the events show are, are ways for the body to learn on how to behave and how to react. So whenever events are happening, we're, we're having to process a whole lot and learn how to best react in order to give us the best chance of survival. Mm -hmm. So the goal here is the body is constantly having an input of information, stress, and needs to have an equal amount of expression, output information right which is energy so if you don't express the energy that's inside of you it stays in the body it kind of oxidizes or it holds on in certain areas and that's mm -hmm. where you know you have i don't want to it's not a simplistic form because you have so many different little systems that are working together and the physiological side of it is one part of it right you have the gut you have the heart you have the skin you have the eyes you have the hearing it, they all play together in this beautiful ecosystem that is your human body. So the body needs to store information somewhere. We want to believe that it's only in the brain. And if we can think of it, we can, we can make it happen. But then my question is always like, you know, from a practical standpoint, I've seen lots of people that bench press, but their shoulders end up getting hurt and their chest doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if the goal of the exercise is to grow the chest and your chest isn't working and you've been bench pressing for two years, are you really bench pressing? Mm. Right? It's a simple question. And so what, what we've learned to do as humans, especially within the strength and, and fitness community or with anybody that is in the physical fitness space, whatever it is, whatever that health or fitness space is, is we think that the exercise gears the result, which is not mm. true. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, 
I mean, I don't not you know not to bring up your neck pain, but you should not have neck pain because Absolutely. you're training, you're moving, you're constantly physically active, but you're still having neck pain. But mm -hmm. at some point, that neck pain is no longer a physiological aspect. Mm -hmm. It's part of the mm -hmm. environment. It's part of a, a somatic error, right? A, a miscommunication between the body and the brain, and we can acknowledge that the heart can speak to the brain subconsciously. Mm -hmm. We can acknowledge that the gut speaks to the brain subconsciously. We understand that the skin, the nanoreceptors of the skin send signals to the brain subconsciously and act, force it to react. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest missing things in the fitness space, in the strength and conditioning space, in the physiotherapy space is it's written clearly that the Golgi tendon intercepts signals from the nanoreceptors so from the skin or from anything around us and if it feels like it's going to be overwhelmed the muscle tissue will turn off mm -hmm. and will become very afferent so that it can go mm -hmm. into position that's why when you have people with frozen shoulders they'll put them in anesthesia and crank the shit out of the shoulder mm -hmm. right so it's not a muscle tension issue it's the muscle in tension either under load under stress or in the environment mm -hmm. so a clear example would be you've been taught to deadlift with an arched back, a big chest, and the knees out. What does that do? It cranks on the lumbar erector. Mm -hmm. At some point, the load and the skill level are going to match up, and you're going to fuck up your back. You're going to start having back spasms, whatever it is. You fail a rep. The body learns. So it goes, that barbell is, is dangerous mm -hmm. because last time I threw out my back. So what does it do? It sees, you see the observation, the rest of the body starts to observe the body, observes the barbell and goes, that's dangerous, turn off these muscles. And the Golgi tendons will not allow the muscles to tense up. And therefore, you start to shut off muscles that are supposed to be working and muscles that hold intensity. And again, this is, goes back to the survival, talking about the evolutionary perspective. What's the best way for a human to survive? To have a safe spine because that's where all mm -hmm. the communication from the brain and the body, right? That's the highway of communication. So the only way that the body can communicate to the brain, like you need to fucking stop is where the pain points, where do you have pain? High in the neck, low in the trap, mid back, low back in front of the hip going towards the spine. It's always towards the spine. It's never away from the spine. Mm -hmm. Your, your, your pecs never like so sorry. You're like, Oh, I can't, I can't push today. It's either the pec minor where it goes up into the high neck and starts going towards the side delt and then goes into the middle of the trap towards the spine. So the smaller, more afferent muscles, which means muscles that send higher amounts of signals, 80% more than efferent muscles, will shoot signals of intensity that cause the pain and discomfort. They're sending those signals because the bigger structural muscles aren't working. And that they're not working because they could be an environmental, they don't feel safe, or because there, there's a lack or a behavioral change or a trauma that happened. That's, mm. that's been my experience. So this, this uh, I, I, when you, you mentioned this idea of afferent and efferent, so afferent is like away, a away for people listening to that, the idea of like, yeah. I'm gonna strip the audio and make it a podcast version as well. But um, the, so all your efforts are not in a one-time vein, um, <laughs> but, uh, the afferent, those, uh, in other words, I think that we're taught to think of those as stabilizer muscles. So, you know, think of like rotator cuff. Or like, is that is that fair to think about that? Like, by stabilizer, meaning smaller sensory dominant muscles relative to efferent, which would be like the larger movers. Is that a fair? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So the afferent muscles are usually, they're, they all have afferent and efferent nerve endings, mm -hmm. right? It's not so violent. the... Yeah, so the key is that some have more than others, depending on the muscle spindle uh, makeup. And so when you look at the smaller muscles that most people are looking at for shoulder pain, for hip pain, low back pain, mm -hmm. so, on, so on and so forth, they tend to have more afferent nerve endings. And that's how they, they start to contract or communicate, right? So how much tension can I create? If it's too much tension, at the end of these, mu especially the bigger muscles, they have what's called the Golgi tendon organ. And that Golgi mm -hmm. tendon organ is a sensory overload or underload. So it, it, it basically sends signals of like, this bicep curl is going to be too heavy and I'm going to tear my bicep. So I'm going to turn the bicep off. Mm -hmm. Right. If you look at it from the scientific standpoint, it makes sense. Like this doesn't work. So therefore I'm going to relax the bicep. I'm going to extend my arm and drop the barbell from a practical 
practical standpoint, we understand it doesn't work. I'm a very stubborn man. I don't know if you're a stubborn man, right? But if, you, if you're told to hold 100 pounds here and do not let go, what are you going to do? You're going to hold that 100 pounds and not let go. Yeah. So they've, they've misrepresented how the signals are being sent to the brain and how the body is being forced to act. So they're saying that if I'm overloaded here, my signals are going to say, go to the tricep and contract the tricep to let go of the barbell. We know that's not true. What's yeah. going to happen? You're going to mind your way into finding more and more tension to the bicep. The bicep's going to turn off, but you still want to go. So what happens? Again, the body's like, we're, we're being overloaded. So you start to go towards the mid-trap, supraspinatus, uh, muscles that have much higher afferent intensity signals. So they, they'll send more pain receptors, if you will to the brain to go, hey, we need to stop this until this starts to burn so much, and then you drop it. Mm -hmm. And that over, you know, thousands and thousands of reps is what leads towards that pain and discomfort. And then more importantly, it starts to lead towards behavioral changes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of <laughs> sense. Um, from a, a – what, what I always find interesting is, like, we – tend to go from a in some sense the earliest understanding of the body is is, is accurate uh but then as we learn more we always tend to want to write things off like you know fascia is not innervated or golgi tendon organs just do this it's like the simple the oversimplified explanation almost always means that there's something we don't understand and we kind of write right. off things we don't understand don't understand what is your you know just in terms of overall like thought and function where does fascia like play in for you like how do you how do you perceive or conceive of that relative to, or because it seems like you favor the neuromuscular muscular dominant model in terms of like what's communicating how the body's moving and stuff like that like what's your perspective there i think that it's part of the communication system but it's not the whole thing i think the the biggest misc conception with the current somatic therapy and the current healers is based on an old model that no longer works today. Mm. And the reason I say that is when we're looking at, you know, like the, the Eastern medicine or the, the way the Maoris dealt with trauma and such, um, and when people are doing like the active releases of trauma through the fascia, they're forgetting one of the biggest factors that when all of this was being practiced, when all of that trauma was being released, what did that person do? They went back to being active. Yes. And okay. now that's... they're sitting. So that's the problem. And that's where I think that the information is stored in the muscle cells because the fascia has a whole lot, but you can passively allow somebody and release the fascia to get the range of motion or to let go of the pain. But when it comes back to doing work, that's when the pain all comes back or the stress all comes back. Mm. So, and so unless there's proper movement and proper engagement and tension and buildup of neural capacity of the bigger muscles, that's where we have the issues. Yeah. So just uh, run, run this by you. I mean, I, I've uh, become friends with the human garage people, huge fans mm -hmm. of them. They're very fascia dominant, very mm. fascia centric. And I think a lot of people really like that message of, and I've had some very profound experiences just getting to meet them, but also like just doing some of those movements. But I think I really like what you said, because what I'm always interested in is like, what's the thing that I take for granted that's also helping this work? And I do think just having a, all right, yes, I can, un, however you want to maneuver my fascia and, and release however you want to phrase that. But I'm also going back into an active lifestyle. I'm using this to like, you know, re connect with my body in some, some form. And then it's like, there right. also seems to be the, like, so what, what I've thought about is this idea of anytime something becomes like a productized thing that's just very easy, then it's like it's almost always missing some piece. So, so uh, in, in this, what I'm referring to is like cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think is valuable just in terms of like being able to kind of process thoughts. But it's like, I, I just, well, I, I don't know if you get the better help ads, but I've thought about this a lot. It's like, it's so ubiquitous and so available and everyone needs to do it. And by the time it gets to everyone needs to do this, we're missing something. There's something that's just, it's too simple to be true. And right. my, my thought is like, all right. So the, the 
these these like words and these thoughts that are stored here they have to map to the body at some level and if you're just processing here without tacking it to a physical action a movement a muscle engagement then like you're you're not getting probably the same sounds like the same thing as if you just release the fashion it's like well you have have to tackle that into like get back into your life like maybe it's you're you're unlocking stored information so to speak whether you're cognitive behavioral therapy or fascial manip manipulations like but where's the active like put that into play and go out into life and do this with a exactly. pattern that is a it shows a transformation of that interiority like is that what you're gonna yeah and, and it's you know it, it's the same thing when it comes to emotional traumas right or mm -hmm. you know mental health to physical health it's it, the principles this are exactly the same they yeah. give you the release but they don't show you how to change the patterns afterwards so you know we can look at it from the fascia release and now you can move and you have this full emotional expression and everything and i i haven't i need to go a little bit deeper into human garage i don't like to get too deep into other people's because i don't for me it's yeah. like i like i'm in my uh, own world of sets I've, um, yeah 100%. <laughs> you know but i i listen if it's if it's helping people that's beautiful and i'm i'm all for it but at some point for me it's always like uh okay so then what comes afterwards because if what we're doing is we're sending signals of safety and change but if the person hasn't changed or evolved then we're having issues and this is where for me strength and con strength and conditioning right where the movement the active side of thing comes in like you talked about productizing how everybody should do it it's so simple it's not it's simple it's not easy because the simplicity is that everybody should be doing it and could be doing it but it's not easy because it takes effort on your part yes. and and, yes. and the same thing happens with ice baths and with everything else it's like I can get into an ice bath passively or actively. And that's my biggest thing is like, you need to do it actively. Mm -hmm. Like if there's no change coming from it, it's not about the, the hormonal changes and everything else that's happening. Cool. But if you're not changing what you do afterwards, the body will recluse back to what's comfortable, no matter what it, but the body is here to survive. And now it's learned to survive. You know, the last two, let's take the last two decades it's learned to survive that it's very comfortable. Like the pandemic, you could stay home, you order food, mm -hmm. like you didn't really suffer. There was heating, there was light, there was water, there was everything you could ever want in your life is essentially in your cave. Like you're, you're good to go, right? Like you're missing social interactions, which is what we're seeing now a lot of is that a social anxiety going through the roof. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's very safe. It's the same thing with any other concept that you're dealing with about your trauma is that we can create safety in it. That's not the hard part. The hard part is never creating safety. Mm -hmm. It's very simple to create a safe environment and to create expression. Yeah. The hard part is how do you build the confidence to allow you to perform again, right? So you were in an abusive, you know, I'm gonna take like an extreme, an extreme version of, of a case client, right? Sure. So abusive relationships, horrible life, abusive from childhood, um, you know, X, Y, and C, like just imagine the most brutal type of, of childhood you could have. And now we create safety because we've expressed a lot of the energy and you feel confident in your skin. You feel safe in your skin, not confident. You feel safe in your skin. But now it's time to start to go out again, start dating again. You start moving again. And so mm -hmm. that's where the real change needs to happen. And that's where most people will just be like, nah, red flags, I'm out. And they go back to what's being safe. They'll sabotage. Mm -hmm. So which yeah, thought on that does that can that safety also incorporate this kind of passive thinking about like meaning i go to cognitive behavioral therapy and i just talk like i'm observing as though like the, the safety is like sorry this idea of growth encapsulated in that is like it seems to me a lot of people are in the growth process of observation if they're passively they're doing the right stuff they're in the ice bath they're talking in therapy they're like doing the releases but it's like there's it's all in a sense passive because it's all they're everything around oh, the outside it's all to fuel their current victimized identity and yes. it's going to sound like an asshole remark but it's the truth right so i have a few clients in la and one of them was very truthful and he goes myself and everybody i know has two therapists because if one doesn't agree with me, I go to the other one <laughs> and they just bounce back. It's like a divorced parent syndrome, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so everybody gets obsessed with this next thing that's going to help them, but they're just looking for the dopamine reward. So 
ice baths right now are trending. So everybody's doing ice baths because it's helping with my anxiety and everything else. But in the end, it's not really because the fact that you're saying the ice bath is helping my anxiety, not I'm changing my anxiety as a tool. I'm using an ice bath. That's a different conversation. So a lot of people are approaching all of these therapies or these morning routines in a passive way. They're hoping that that routine is going to change them. And mm -hmm. that's where the simple part comes in, but it's not easy. And they want to make it easy. Mm -hmm. right? right. So if the simplest example, again, I, I always go back to the bench press, but you can use anything else of, of that sort, right? Like if I do bench press, my chest is going to grow. We know that's not true. Right. And so what ends up happening as a simple if you do bench press correctly while engaging your pecs, your, be your bench will grow, your pecs will grow. But you could do bench press with the shoulders, you could do bench press with the traps, you could do bench press all sorts of different ways. So yeah. the exercise, the activity, the tool does not gear the results. You choosing to evolve within the tool is what gears the results. It's the intensity and the intentful action of being in the movement that gears the results. And sometimes those intentful movements need to be softer and kinder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they need to be pushed because the mental side is too analytical and therefore you never are able to surpass certain barriers. Mm. I, you mentioned the word intention and I, I've been thinking about that a lot. So I, I uh, as a, it's also uh, a trending as, word. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Everything is. I, in, so there's two two thoughts to go down that um, one is John Sarno, which I don't know if you're familiar with him, but I would love to go down that that the discussion. But um, one of the things I think is interesting. So I do a little bit of jujitsu. Uh, I've, I've been out this last four or five weeks of travel and then just dealing with the this, which for people listening, at some some neck irritation of a nerve or something like that that basically shut down my right shoulder and arm and, and neck, and it's pretty much ninety five percent back now which is good but uh planning to get back to jujitsu after this but or as in today but one thing i've noticed is the idea of like intention like if somebody doesn't want like there's there's difference between picking up 100 pounds and then there's a difference between someone that's like doesn't want to be picked up like i've got you can almost feel it when you do jujitsu and you're rolling it's like somebody like that is a black belt has a very strong intention of like this is not going to happen and their body is aligned in that intention with someone that's a white belt it's like they may have, they don't want to be picked up or moved, but it's like, they don't know how to align that intention. And so like the idea, like, I would love to hear you talk more about this idea of like intention, because I do see people, there's a difference. People go, they'll go work out. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, my loving, my loving girlfriend partner. She'll go work out. It's like, oh, I did this. It's like, and it's like, I, I see sometimes it's like, there's an intention. Like you have to go in, like, you can't just do the reps. Like, yes, that's helpful to get people started, but eventually you have to switch into like, I'm going to do this. Right. And like that I have to like, what talk to, do you have anything more to say on that, that concept idea? Yes. So the body will go through five stages and we can go a little bit deeper into them. Right. So mm -hmm. the, the, the mind, the body, the whole system, the system as a whole will go through five stages before it can actually want to actively do something or learn the lesson it needs to learn, right? So it starts with boredom. I wanna do jujitsu, that sounds fun. Then you go towards anxiety. Well, how would I get started? I need to go find the right club. I need to go find the right teacher. Do I wanna to go to black belt? You start to strategize how you're gonna do it. Then you start to get frustrated because you realize that you thought it was gonna be a breeze because you strategized correctly, but you know it was a lot harder than you thought it was gonna be. Then you start to get pissed off at others. So you get angry at others. So that's like, that fucking purple belt was not being nice today and I'm just trying to work on my skill and he's trying to pretend that he's in the World Cup, whatever it may be. And then you realize that you're just not that good and you need to get better. And now you start to change. So that's how the brain starts to work. Uh, when you, you start to align it with the body, you start to look that through the boredom side, you start to go through the movements, hoping that you're just going to make you better, right? Mm. So you're mm -hmm. like, okay, so I'm kind of bored, but I want to start. So if I just start going to classes, I'm going to become a black belt eventually, right? It's, it's kind of that simplistic way. Then you get towards anxiety. The anxiety has a physical and a mental overwhelm or a physical and a mental quit, right? Mm -hmm. So the physical quit would be more of a, my heart rate starts to go up because there's people that are kind of moving my body in different ways and I don't like it and I want to quit. The mental quit is you trying to, you know, become like i don't want to go hard today i just want to i just want to work on the skill today's just about the skill and five years later it's just about the skill i don't want to go I, I, we're not sparring 
Like, you know what I mean? I don't want to be rolling. I just, I'm working on the skill, man. Just let me get the skill down right. Listen, man, the world isn't owe you shit. Go fucking hard, right? So that's yeah. the mental and physical quit. Then you get towards frustration where it's the emotional quit. That's where you actually start to express a little bit of like, whoa, bro, mellow it down. We're supposed to be going 60% and that felt like you're going 65%. Like, you know, you, you start to have a little bit of this frustration start to, to come out of you. And so in jiu-jitsu, right, it's a sport. So there's two people involved. When you're talking about somebody like your girlfriend, there is this concept of, okay, so I'm going to go train and I want to look X, Y, and Z. And as you're starting to do exercises and you're asking things of people, right? So like you're having neck pain and I say, Hey, your neck pain is a, a simple solution, right? So simple solution. If you activate your pecs and your lats, the neck's going to relax. The high trap, the mid trap, it's all going to start to relax. And you're like, yeah, that's easy. So you start to go and you start to connect to the pecs a little bit. And then you start to create this physical overwhelm. So the physical overwhelm is I'm trying to get rid of my neck pain. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do a pec fly with two and a half pounds, but I'm going to pretend this, these two and a half pounds are 500 pounds. So you're like, you immediately over clench. So you start to do a physical quit. The heart rate goes up and immediately the whole thing is overwhelming. And what do you do? You'll go immediately to the trap, mm -hmm. right? The second one would be a mental quit. So you're going to go do, you know, let's say I gave you pec flies as an exercise, just as an example, to get rid of neck pain. And you start to hold the dumbbells and immediately in your head, you go, this is going to hurt my neck. This is going to hurt my neck. Why am I doing this? I know it's going to hurt my neck. So you're immediately telling yourself that your neck's going to hurt. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? So it's a physical quit. Then eventually you're going to start doing pec flies. Let's say you send me a video and I go, hey, but if you look at your shoulder, it's going out of whack. If you go, you're, looking, you're loading the trap on the way up, on the way down because you're disconnecting at the pec, blah, 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 blah. And you go, I just don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just not going to do it. It's an emotional overwhelm. Right? Mm -hmm. So in order for the intent to be right, you need to be able to have low enough skill to push the physical intensity enough so that your mind can be quiet and do the work. The body needs to do the work, not the brain. And everything that we do now within health and fitness, within any sport, it's always about progressing the skill, never evolving the intensity of the exercise. And so that's so, where you start. Yeah, go for it. The idea of the body needs to do the work. It, so the, by skill, so a lot of a lot of people uh, today, is, it's, and I do think that I could, I could blame out some reasons why I think this is the case, but it's become much more popular to talk about patterns and movement and, uh, you know, like whether it's functional patterns or coiling or rotating. It's like this idea of like, oh, we, we you know, we, we revert we take away the intensity and we just add in this movement. And so as though, like, if I could just pattern this over and over again, I could learn how to punch in a sense. And it, it, this is almost indirect response to the overt intensity of five by five by five, uh, which is like the squat bench deadlift, which is, you know, just get in there, do this, this, like move the bar, this, this, you know, this small little path. And then, you know, the, the only thing that matters is the percentage of your total one rep max that you're doing for the five by five, if five, right. three, one, et cetera. And those, w would you say that the problem is the divorcing of those things where when it's all about like, let's make the movement as simple as possible and just focus on intensity or let's make the movement as complex as possible, just focus on skill. Like by skill, it's not necessarily, it can, it's like a very- Both be quitting mechanisms. So th that's yeah. the thing is that we're, we're, remember that humans want to be part of a social concept. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that's, the, what, that's one of the biggest things. So if CrossFitters are all going to do ring muscle-ups, then as I'm joining this tribe, I should be doing a ring muscle-up no matter what. Right? Yeah. And so what, what ended up happening is we're looking, and again, this is why I see behavioral traits and muscles, is we look at exercises as the position will gear the results. But we know that's not true. So the, the you know, simple example is if I squat, I should have a bigger booty. And I know lots of people that don't have bigger booties. And if you do squats for volume or X, Y, and Z, their lower backs are flared up. 
Mm. I know people that bench mm. press all the time and their shoulder is flared up and they blame the exercise. Mm. They're blaming other things. Where are they at? They still haven't learned that it's them fucking up the exercise. They're mm. angry at others or angry at the barbell, frustrated. So what if I were to say, okay, so we're going to do bench press to grow the pecs, but we're only going to do to your mobility, right? So we can, we can find our mobility through our inhale. So if you, like right now, if you want to try, like, which is the shoulder that hurts? Uh, well, this is, depends on the time. This well, is uh, just <laughs> multiple, like, a lot on the right side, right? So the left, put your, one so right. put your left side, put your, put your hand on, on one pec, right? And, and contract it. Can you contract the bottom part of the pec? Do you feel a contraction? Um, the, I have bit. historically had very small pecs, and I've always known that there's likely a a, a lack of connection there. So, like the bottom part, uh, not so much, but I can contract the pre the pec broadly. Okay. okay. So, put bring your hand to your kind of close to your face, like if you're going to do an overhead press, contract it as much as you can. It's not, again, it's not okay. 500 pounds, and all you're going to do is you're going to as you press up, you're going to inhale, and you're going to see that. You're going to stop inhaling when the pec turns off. That's your mobility. That's your active range of the pec. If you go well, past it, it turns off. I have to off. contract. I have to. Okay, so is, I hold the contraction. That's your mobility. Go past that. Try to go past that breath. You're going to displace the tension to the side delt and then to the mid trap, and that's why your shoulder hurts. It's. It's almost <laughs> it, well. The, the the confusing part is it almost feels like I just run out of oxygen. But I suppose like meaning like so I, I can inhale so, longer there. Are you inhaling in a specific way, like slow? Um, <laughs> you can do it slower or faster. You're gonna stop in the same spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pec turns off, and you can't move. The, you can't move past that point. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, if we can understand what we want out of the exercise or we can understand what it takes to do the exercise, we can find the mobility. So doing a back squat to the end range because, you know, it's said that we need to get below, uh, you know, below knee, knee height, hip width, below the knee, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing the squat the correct way. Mm -hmm. You're doing it for a point of performance for a competition. Okay. So these are the things that, you know, you start to look at and you start to see the, the mechanisms start to break down, right? So then we can talk about like the behavioral traits that you start to do when you start to lose the, the, the pecs. So I'm guessing that you do a lot more for others than you do for yourself. You're always willing to bring yourself out before you're actually willing to pay attention to yourself. You lack a little bit of self-love. You lack a little bit of self-pride and you're always looking for confirmation of mentors. You know, we can start to look at that and then we can start to pay attention to of where the discomfort is in the body. And then I can tell mm -hmm. you what's happening in your environment. And we can start to change that if you want to, because I'm not the one to play God and I'm not the one to be the captain of your ship. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to present you the options as a navigator going, hey, we can take these 10 routes. Which one do you want? Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's your route. It's not mine. So I'm guessing that you probably get pain in your left adductor as well. Um, you mean? Hit? Yeah. Like, uh, um, I have, uh, well, and this is, yeah. So there is a, a significant amount of weakness there. I've um, had a functional hip shift uh, leg length discrepancy where my right side just, like, body pulls over that side. So almost probably extreme in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where the physical and the environmental and the behavioral all come into play mm -hmm. but this, this is where the when we go back if we want to take it back to the fascia stuff it's all great but if there was no work done on the structural side the fascia is great but what mm -hmm. holds the body healthy the muscles do mm -hmm. the muscles dictate where to pull the bone or the joint out of place otherwise you're just stacking bone on bone and then what happens you you have bone on bone on the knees that never that's never good mm -hmm. but if you have healthy quads healthy hamstrings then you you can actually move correctly mm. like i had a client earlier this year that was having a double hip replacement and all we did was actually build up the psoas major and the glutes and now there's no discomfort in the hip or the back and there's no need for a hip replacement and the entire behavior is starting to change there was a lot to express there was a lot of things that have been locked up in the hips so the, the thing is that we want to fragment because it's easier, yeah. but it's 
all connected in it. And we put, again, that emotional overwhelm, that frustration is that we put, I always say like that frustration, that emotional overwhelm is when you're putting something on the pedestal. We put these emotions on our pedestal. Like we're going to be dramatic or I don't want to ask for help or I feel anxious or we put it on this pedestal. We, we think it is, but it's not really that. It's just energy. It's just information going out, information coming in. It doesn't need to be more than that. There's intensity, and yes, there could be tears and things like that, but who doesn't cry? Like, it's part of human nature. It's the same as a fart or a burp, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, we all need to cry, too. Like, it's just, it's part of human, it's just, it's part of what we are, <laughs> you know? And so people will block that stuff in because of conditioning, because of parents or upbringing or whatever it may be. And so we start to put these shields up. But in the end, emotions is just the true expression of energy that's been brought in. And we're just as humans as a whole trying to understand how to best express in order to A, be part of the tribe and how to fit in and to try and best survive so that we can find a mate and reproduce. Now that's, that construct is starting to change a little bit, but for the most part, that's, it's still essentially at the bare, bare, you know, innards is what, we, what we're trying to do is how do we best, you know, share the information that we've learned and pass it on to others. And we think that it needs to be done through a nurture side, but we understand that nature has a big part of the genetics and epigenetics and everything that's being passed down, the behavioral traits, psychological and otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all tied in together. It's just that people like to fragment because it's easier. And yeah. it's much easier to say, I'm going to focus on, you know, I'm going to get a PhD on how the bicep works, but then we forget about the pecs and the tears, which is one of the biggest things that we need for a proper bicep curl. Mm -hmm. It doesn't makes sense so one of the things that they get trapped at well there's uh, two questions one is um so the five stages are like boredom anxiety frustration uh, what were the last anger two anger at others and then anger at yourself okay it's so a, that that's and that uh, inspires that's from the selfish brain theory yeah okay um then the other side is you know oftentimes in these conversations and i i do think it's the closest way you could you know, warded, but it, it seems like it's it's easy to say, oh, we, you know, we're going to go through and express these emotions and kind of like work through this. Like you're working through stuff at the hip, which is at a top level, exactly what you're doing. But from a tangible level that like if people wanted to like explore this and really embody this themselves, those who have an intention, let's say they're at the anger itself, or they're, they're at least uh, turning inward as a direction, like I need to do this for myself. No. When... <sighs> What, what is this like so for example like are, are, i you become darkly aware of the things in your body or i have these pains i have this potentially okay I've, i i was aware at some capacity of you know okay i have these these stiffness in the neck and the shoulders you know it's kind of been a lifelong thing or dysfunction in the shoulders and then there's a level of uh, okay my pecs aren't that big or, or activated I'm, I'm lacking ability in these certain movements i want to go and work on this stuff my experience with every let's say iteration of this growth cycle if you, if you will has been there is the confusion there's a lot of confusion as you're doing it because when you are let's say moving through a set of muscles and a set of movements you're you're embodying a set of movements the emotions that come with it seem to be all encompassing meaning when i'm angry i forget to think that like oh this is the thing you know for example like if i give you something a, a candy that's sour and you say, I'm like, here, this is a sour. And you go, oh, it's sour. And I'm like, yeah, but you knew to expect that. This is the experience. You can remind yourself that this is the experience of sour. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't tell you, like, here you go. I'm like, today you're going to experience sour. And then I go, you know, go through your day and have this candy. And like, you'd be like, what is wrong with me? Like, there's this, there's this being, feeling of being in the emotion that we forget that it's like, oh, this is a cloud I'm passing through as opposed to, like, this is part of the process. This is the plan, part of the trip. Like, it's supposed to be sour but you're you're setting up the expectation the problem is that you're again you gave me something that's sour i'm expect to be sour and i tell you ah it's sour the problem is that everybody is saying your shoulders hurt right as an example go do the pec deck mm -hmm. and that's going to help you they're giving exercise based on position like have you ever just tried to go get a pec pump not caring about let's you know i'll bring back bench press because i feel like everybody knows bench press right not caring about if you get the bar all the way down to the bottom not caring about 
the weight that you're using, not caring about the sets and reps. Have you ever just tried to go find your pecs while bench pressing? That's a different, that's a different ideology. Right. So the problem is that we keep trying to make people better by giving them recipes rather than by giving them experiences. Mm. So, again, yeah. I'm a food and drink guy. I, I don't know if you're if you're a good a big foodie or, or if you enjoy. I this. Uh, I enjoy the feeling of being the problem is I enjoy being full and feeling the I, I, I have yet to step back to enjoy the experience. I'm much we're, more. We're going to have a good time in Sacramento. I'm, <laughs> sure we will. So, so but okay so like you know take like an experience that you can't put in words right so the first like losing your virginity um you know getting married <laughs> Object right? <terror> and embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean you can try to put it to words but you're like nah man like you know what i mean like your honeymoon like your your wedding day like your partner like take like your first date like you can try and put that stuff into words but it will never, ever, ever be the same as the actual experience. Yeah. It's the same thing with movement. I can tell you how, and, and I mean, you've talked to Mark Bell, like he can tell you what it's like to, to go into like that mindset, that, that full switch to I'm going to do this and that it needs to be aligned physically, mentally, and emotionally. And there's no words. You can try and put it into words and be a storyteller and a philosopher about it, but it never encompasses the perfection of what it feels like to do it. And it's the same thing with the pecs or when you truly connect, actively connect to a muscle, to a bigger muscle. And so it's more of a, okay, so, you know, going back to like the bench press, like if you haven't spent an hour trying different contractions, different mindsets, different hand positions, different foot positions, different breathing patterns, different weights, different loads, different objectives, different, mm -hmm. you know, there's 150,000 ways. I'm making up a number. Don't quote yeah. me on that. Right. But yeah. there's a million ways to do the bench press. You haven't tried all of them. You keep trying the same thing. So you're going to go fucking insane that your, your chest isn't getting better, but you keep following the same fucking recipe. Sorry for my cussing. I don't know if you're, no, um, I, yeah. I don't give a fuck. I get, I get yeah, passionate. I um, no, I like it. But you know what I mean? So, it, so it's, it's, we need to understand that, A, what's the objective? Mm -hmm. And behind every objective, we need to create safety, confidence, and performance. Very simple. You cannot get performance if you don't have safety. Safety being in the mind, in the body, in the heart, right? Emotionally speaking, mm -hmm. in the environment. So if you're lacking, safety in one of those the muscles will turn off why because we have the golgi tendon organ that is directly being fed information from nanoreceptors from the skin the eyes the ears whatever it's perceiving and as soon as it perceives danger it'll shut the muscle off because it doesn't want to tear mm -hmm. because if we were to go back again evolutionary speaking if you were to actually tear your pec major that's a big fucking deal for the tribe you're screwed <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you can't yeah. lift your arm up and there's war happening or whatever's happening, you're screwed. Like, you know, we've had this comfort and this safety and this easiness of life in the last, man, since 1960. But I mean, in reality, 1940s, you look at World War II, like that shit wasn't easy, man. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Before that, you had the Great Depression, World War One. Like life has not been this easy ever. And we're yeah. expecting to do all this stuff. And, and, and again, the studies that have been done have been done incorrectly because they fragment in thinking that muscle is a stake. So yeah, nobody ever actually yeah, yeah. paid attention. And when you actually start to look at the, how they studied the Golgi tendon organ and these stuff, they were just shocking cats. So the information is still not really all that relevant. So, so it's I, up to I, us they, to take the practical side of science. And that, that's a, that's kind of what I'm figuring out is like with fascia, I guess, as a corollary for, they were like, oh, it's innervated or it's not innervated. It's just this thing you have to cut away. And if you can't even see, it's not big enough. And now they're like, actually, it's not. And then the same thing with muscle. It's like, it's just a dumb sack of meat. It's not, there's no, you know, muscle memory and stuff like that. It's like, it probably is way too, like, you know, but probably is definitely wrong in a sense because it misses the point. I mean, the I, I there's, guess there's a reason that there's nerve endings into every spindle yeah. cell. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? and the and the craziest part is that they don't fucking know so all they tell you is oh we'll just cut off the nerves we'll, we'll burn the nerves off so you don't feel it <laughs> you're like I, what 
<laughs> just some of these these surgeries are just so brutish. Um, so I get to now that I, I've got better words for the, the question, the experience I've had when moving through, meaning if like if there's pain or injury or like or anger stored in the body or fear, like the experience of doing that is like I I'm frustrated. I can't get my like. It's almost like if you really if you're too observant of the the thing, you're almost passive. It's like, oh, I'm going to go work on my pack. I'm observing myself work on my pack. I'm, I, but I'm never working on my pack. And like to be in that experience is to be in like to be washed over by the emotion and to allow that to express. Is that right? Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yes. Yeah, so I'll give you the experience because again, I can we can talk about it, but you'll get the experience when I go to Sacramento. But essentially, what you're looking at is there's a hierarchy of contractions. So the muscle spindle cell has nerve endings that go from type 1A afferent to type 1B efferent, afferent. Then they go towards the efferent, the gamma motor neurons and the alpha motor neurons. So they're essentially part of the phylogenetic hierarchy. There's muscles that aren't working. They're in a full collapse. They're in the type A afferent, I believe it is. So it's a static uh, afferent signal. So you can still complete the exercise. So that's like when you're walking or when you're running. Like, could you imagine how difficult it could be to always be absolutely present while you're walking? No, the body needs this recovery too, right? So this is part of the very reactive part of the body that allows the exercises to continue to happen. And then as it starts to become more intense, because now there's a hill or there's rocks when you kind of climb up and down a little bit, whatever it may be, then we start to go towards 1B afferent. This is where we start to see a lot more uh, reactiveness from the muscles. And again, if the afferent, if the, the Golgi tendon organ senses that there's going to be any sort of overload, it'll short, shut off and it'll start to send signals elsewhere for the body to compensate to complete the objective. And then after a while, you'll start to go towards the efferent, the gamma and the alpha motor neurons, which is you actually doing the exercise. Mm. So most of the exercises that we do at the beginning, whenever you start a new skill, it's amazing because you're, have, you're forced to be present and you're being active. Eventually, the body starts to go, okay, I know this exercise. I don't need to be here. Mm. I could be doing my, you know, I'm, I, I'm strategizing my fight with my girlfriend or my partner. I'm doing my taxes. I'm trying to think about what I'm going to go out and do with the boys, whatever it may be. And you're still doing the exercise. You're passively doing the exercise. This is what happens with 90% of people, 95% of people after six months of doing any sort of boot camp, CrossFit, running, whatever it may be. They're no longer actively searching to become better at the craft of the movement. So the neuroplasticity goes away and it just becomes reactive movement. That's why you see people that train for years and years and years. The aesthetics don't change. They're not there. They're present. So the body goes through this action of afferent to efferent. And this is where, this is my own opinion. And I don't know if there's anybody that's written anything about it out there or anything, but this is where I've come to my conclusion with the experiences that I have. The more that we can get the muscle to truly go towards that efferent side, meaning you actively contracting, elongating, and tensing the muscle, that's where we can get a true moment of presence. There's a guy, and I forget his name, it's called quantum leaping, which creates a true moment of presence, which allows you to see your behavioral cycles, allows you to have that epiphany moment about yourself, and allows you to change the course of how you react to other things. I had this thought yesterday, well, I was, I was just, I was doing a, like a QL raise or whatever, like you're on a back extension machine doing sideways. And I kind of, I, I felt this, this like area of stiffness between my like rib cage and hip and on my right side, but that wasn't on my left side. And I was like, I, I was like, you know, I, I go through these reps. It's like one, two, three. And it's like, but if the point is muscle engagement, it would probably make more sense if I like held the long, like potentially like you got like a fascial like lengthening or whatever you like the full yeah. length of it. And then like a full contraction of it. It's like, and just, even if I did like a three second, like, I wonder what would happen there. And it's like, it's ironic that you were having the same conversation. It's like, it almost feels, I, I, I don't know if you've ever done like a psychedelic uh, experience, like, you know, mushrooms or anything like that, but like, you feel this full, like I am fully present. And then yet most of our life we get like, we touch that. It's like the, if you've done a trip, you know what it's like to do a trip, but if right. you, and you also know what it's like to just barely touch it. It's like really being in the, like getting, putting your toe in the water versus getting in the cold plunge kind of thing. It's like, and I was saying, so it sounds to me as though 
when you are training, if you do it with intention and correct, like the desire to grow, the experience, we, most people go to the gym and it's almost like they're, they're touching the water like over and over and over again, as opposed to really like getting in and being fully in like, most, is it almost people, like most people are going to the gym being like a fitness influencer and they take a five minute picture and then go away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, yeah. they, they do their rep and they get on their phone and they start texting and none of them are present in the gym trying to create intensity. Most of them, right? And, and, and this is me from going, I go to a global gym here and I see people walk in. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, again, it's a passive way of training. I'm going to the gym because they say it's healthy because movement is mm -hmm. medicine and it's supposed to help with depression. No, proper movement, present movement is intensity. And so we can use the word in, in, intent, going with intent, but it's, it's more of a, what is it that you're wanting to change? Movement is a way for you to work on past problems and create a change for the future. You, you get to decide what it is that you want. And so for most people, and this is something you can kind of start to play with, is when you're seeing people in the gym, how they behave in the gym is how they behave in the outside world. When stress gets too much and they decide to quit, that's exactly what they do when they're outside in the real world. That's why I love fitness. That's why I love movement. Like this has been my one vision, my one mission, my one question to always answer is where is the value in me as a coach and professional in this space? And how can I provide that value? And now I see it because I get to change the behavior of people because how I allow them to deal with stress in the gym is exactly how they're being conditioned to deal with stress in the outside world. And this is again, going back to building the muscles but also showing them because again, you can tell an addict they're an addict, but they're like, nah, man, I'm good. I'm still partying, whatever it may be, or, you know, whatever it is, but the, the movement part of it, the physical part of it shows the emotional expression exactly how they will when life gets overwhelming outside of the gym. And this is also the, the space where we can change those behavioral cycles. Mm. It, it's, So I, I, is it fair to say, because if you do this correctly, going to, the, going to the gym with intention is a far more taxing event than it would be when most people do it. 100%. And in that. And much more effective. <laughs> yes. You have to be at the right mind. Like you can't just, let me go to, the, there's, there's something, maybe it's like a, maybe the equivalent of a quick workout is just like masturbating. It's like, I'm just going to do this real quick. And like, it, it gives a little bit of like a stress relief, but it doesn't actually like provide that same level of uh, like presence and evaluation for people that are in pain. It seems like the pain is a signal that your body is directing the focus of what your training needs to be for that day or that time period. Like, okay, let's just say your shoulder, like this is, you really don't need to worry about anything else other than like spending time exploring this. Right. And then, is that, if that's fair? Yeah. The, yeah, go, go off that one for a second. I mean, life is never linear, right? right? So life is never the same. And there's always going to be, like, I always say life doesn't owe you shit. The goal is mm -hmm. to be prepared for life. And so if your shoulder is hurting, but the program calls for X, Y, and Z, and you know it's going to fuck up your shoulder, you're doing yourself an, a disjustice. But you're doing it because of, you know, this mantra of like discipline, just go get the hard work in. If you're quitting on a mental side, then okay. But when it's a physical, like, man, I can barely even raise my shoulder. This is like a, you need to be kind to yourself. Mm. Like being kind to yourself is going, hey, today I don't need to be doing bench press at 90% because my shoulder or my elbow, whatever it is, is just not feeling it. So I'm going to do another thing. Right. Or, you know, the same thing can go for like, I'm feeling super stressed out because I have everything going on in my business. You go, okay, so today I'm going to go and kind of get my head together and zone myself into what needs to take priority so I can bring down the stress level. The whole point of the gym and the movement side of things, at least in my perspective, is to better your life outside of the gym. And it mm. seems to be the opposite. People seem to get addicted to going to the gym even though everything else, because they're wanting to escape their life, right? And so yeah. I'm always like, you know, I was, a, I, was, uh, I was very deep into powerlifting and wanted to go CrossFit games and do everything. And at some point I realized, I was like, man, I get the whole aspect of achieving something amazing. That's great. But my investment to my reward is just not matching up. You know what I mean? Like I'm 
sacrificing family time. I'm sacrificing me time. I'm sacrificing my joint health. I'm sacrificing a whole lot of things going on for what, you know, and, and, and I was, you know, potentially going to worlds and doing all this stuff. But at some point it was like, okay, so I'm going to shift my perspective of what I want. But I started to see people that were, I mean, not even wanting to do that. They just wanted a five pound PR on their snatch. And they were willing to sacrifice time with their kids on the weekend time, you know, their shoulder health, like all of this. I was like, guys, it's not like we're, we're getting our, we're, we're shifting the objective of why we got into the gym in the first place. So it's, it's more about having a deeper understanding of why you're moving and what it is that you're, I always say you're, you're always trying to figure out who are you saying fuck you to? Because mm. whenever you go to like the move to the gym to kind of punish yourself, you're kind of wanting to do a fuck you to somebody. And if you guys are listening out there, you'll realize that when you go to the gym, like most of the times you're going there to say fuck you to somebody, right? Like, like it's, it's, it's a bit of a, you're trying to express it for somebody else. And when you actually want to, when you ch make that shift of like, no, like I want to do it because I want to show myself that I can do something, the entire intensity changes. You actually push harder. The body, the body aesthetics change a lot more and you're actually able to connect a lot better because then I realized that it's not about doing a five by five on the bench press. It's about getting a sweet pump on the bench press. So I'm just going to do one set of 30 because it feels good. Mm. Right. Or it's going to be, I've had a lot of stress. I've, I've been carrying on a lot of, you know, stress from family and work and, and I, I'm frustrated with certain clients or I'm frustrated with this or that. So I'm going to go dominate the barbell because I know that I can't go fucking yell at my boss. I can't punch him in the face. I can't express that there. But if I have a grab, if I grab a barbell and I put, you know, 400 pounds or hundred pounds, whatever your strength levels are, and you fucking pull that thing up with confidence and slam it on the ground, you're going to feel pretty good because you're letting out energy. Again, it's information coming in, information going out. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've, I've noticed recently, just, even this last, I don't know, you could you could say it's kind of a, a switch in some capacity, but I, I've um, a lot of what I like to do is like teach people like repattern some of these athletic things. Cause I, I for what for either for any number of reasons, I never really had a basic like education in athleticism. So one of the programs I've kind of putting together recently is this idea of like very basic athletic skills, and part of it is like foot skills, like dribbling a soccer ball or like. Uh, like skipping and hopping, like how did like very, I'm talking like very yeah. basic third grade yeah. level stuff, but I've I've gone out and 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 Simo's you'll meet him. This is giant anomaly of a human, but he always like he played soccer as a college kid, so he like dribbled a soccer ball. So I've always wanted to dribble, dribble, like juggle a soccer ball and learn to dribble. And so just like going out to the field, I used to go out to the track and I go three sessions a week and. I had like with the I had to be like fuck you if you don't walk away feeling like you're you know exhausted and you're you know doing a barefoot and all this stuff and it's like now I'm like I'm gonna go bring a soccer ball I got my little kettlebell I'll mess around like and just kind of like have fun for 20 30 minutes and play and it's like yeah. I just set the timer and go and there's a whole level of it it feels almost like I'll do an hour hour and a half of like you know running around and having like playing and just trying different skills and it's like I leave and it's like if yeah, you didn't do workout it's like why do i feel that way because it's like by any like heart rates up like it's going and it's like well because it didn't feel like, like you were in danger or something like that. there's some level right. of that which is a weird reflection but even adding that in more it's like I, it, it's it's it, you're you're there's it's it's strange to think that the thing i really wanted to do is the idea of like saying fuck you to myself or like the body like, yeah fuck you i'm gonna go and like beat you up kind of thing <laughs> maybe it's just a displacement of where i would like to be angry towards other people because i'm probably overdoing it like you said earlier um but to, to your point like that that's kind of like the idea of adding in just things because like yeah i would love to work on this skill because it'd be fun and the if i track the actual numbers my heart rate and calories it would be fun it's it's just as much as another workout but i don't walk away feeling like i died right and that you're feels present almost, in the moment yeah and, and that that and again this is where people have a misunderstanding of going towards a sympathetic fight is mm. because going through that that sympathetic fight means that there's coordination, there's focus, and there's flow. You're coordinating, attacking, and dribbling and playing on the ball. That's you hunting. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're exploring. You're active. It, you're zoned in mentally, physically, and, and emotionally. So you're technically in a sympathetic state. You're flowing and you're moving, and that's needed. But it's, it's not a, a 
we've been told that going towards the sympathetic state or training hard or like, you know, doing these things, like you said, like you need to walk out, like you've just been beaten in war. How come mm -hmm. we can't win? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so training should lead us to, yeah, you know, once every, you know, we should learn to how to lose and, and push that intensity to loss. But we also need to learn how to win. And most of the people start to, the, the problem is that they, they make the objective the, the full goal. The objective is to be healthier long term, right? For whatever that may be. But we start to make this objective a very, uh, you know, sets, reps, percentages. There's a precise number that creates a proper or improper workout session or rep. And that's what needs to change mm -hmm. because that's needed. The creative side, the moving side, the flowing side is very much needed. That allows you to be more focused when stress comes in. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's part of the evolution is now you understand that you can be kind to yourself and you can actually allow yourself to have these good things. And that in return allows you to be more focused when stress gets higher. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, it's a balance of, the, of a spectrum. Yeah. So speaking of the balance part, I, I often see the segmented part of this conversation. I kind of think of Instagram, not Instagram, like social media as this like, it, it is the divorced parent syndrome where it's like, when I feel like I want this, I'm going to this person. When I feel like I want this, I'm going to go to this person. It's like, right. what part of the brain is the one that's choosing to go to these places? But you know, it's, it, there are obviously the, the Goggins types that are like, you know, stay hard, do your work, just focus on like, you know, circumstances don't change responsibility kind of thing. And then there's the release, like the yoga, like be kind to yourself in this aspect. How much of that, like how much of the idea of, you're talking about people who are willing to go sacrifice and do like sacrifice all this time and effort to go and work five pounds on their snatches. That person is almost has swung the other side where they're like, okay, you're, you're, avoiding your passive mechanism of avoiding real problems is inactive like i'm going to try and like you're at you're digging holes so to speak in the backyard versus the other person that actually would be benefited by just like putting your head down and doing that burn the questions to use julian's yeah. uh, phrase is that like a level of is at first you're in pain and you're having problems in your life it's almost the opposite of what you naturally do meaning if i just like tend to oh i'm gonna observe i'm gonna think too much and i'm a mental quit like how would someone calibrate this based off of like their own thing? Because it's not as simple as you should be. People yeah, that want to hear that I mean, are going to say, oh, be kind to myself. And it's like, yeah, but it's probably not being, where you need being to be. Kind to yourself is not being soft to yourself, right? So I say that Ooh, uh, quite good. often, right? And so it, being kind to yourself means going into the intensity. I mean, maybe not to the depths of Goggin. <laughs> you know, that, that's a whole, a whole other human being and an and a anomaly in its own. But it's a, you know, it's, you need a balance of both. Like, I'm always, I don't know if you watch South Park, but there was an episode and I don't watch much South Park, but this is one of the episodes that like I, I remembered watching. It was really funny with the, it was like the bloods and the crypts were stuck and like wanting to kill each other and butters came out. It was like, can't we all just get along? And, and I, somebody, one of the characters came out, right? So it's like, why can't we have both, right? Why yeah. can't we have the mental peace, the emotional, the calmness? And when it comes time to fight, you have to fight. And mm -hmm. you go hard and you do hard shit. And that's the hardest thing is that people want one or the other. And again, I think it goes back to the emotional quit. It goes back to conditioning. It goes, there, there's a whole lot of, you know, we can try and make it simplistic, but in reality, it's, it's, it's a bit complex in the sense that some people, you know, I, I have a couple of clients right now that I'm working there. I'm like, just be kind to yourself because they've wrecked themselves. And now the arm doesn't lift up. And so we spent 20 minutes, like, you know, out of, uh, we did a, a, a session and we spent 20 minutes breathing. And then, you know, there's somebody that can do ring pull-ups and, you know, muscle ups and dips and everything, but the shoulder hurts like a motherfucker, but mm -hmm. they still do it because they want to be part of the tribe. So on and so forth with two and a half kilos, five pounds, we just squeezed. And I was like, just breathe. And like I did right now with you, like the breathing, <sighs> there's a very clear reason for the breathing, no holding of the breath. Find the contraction of the muscles. Be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. Tears started to roll down the face. We let the dumbbell down. Shoulder pain went away. The pecs started to contract. Mm. So there's times, and again, it depends on how much pain and discomfort you want to be in, right? I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not here to be the captain of anybody's ship. Mm -hmm. I'm here to allow you to be your truest self, to see your true identity, and allow you to make the decisions of what it is that you want to change or not change or evolve in your life. And there's a lot of 
different mechanisms going from, you know, my, my medium is not the cognitive side, the speaking, the therapist side. I let the body speak for itself and mm-hmm. I let the body speak louder than the mind. That's mm-hmm. where my craft really comes in. And that's what allows me to go, okay, so you need to be kinder to yourself. We're going to go to intensity, but it's a soft intensity. So rather mm-hmm. than thinking that you have, you know, a hundred pound barbell, it's two and a half pounds. It's five pounds. Just lightly squeeze it. And then from there, we start to make progress. I create safety in the body, which gives confidence in the mind, which allows performance, which allows less inflammation, less of the smaller muscles to blast with intensity and create pain. That's all I do. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it sounds simple, right? There's a whole lot that goes behind it. Yeah. But you, know, you get the, the key. It's, I, I'm, I'm definitely allowing the body to speak louder than the mind, which allows the emotional expressions, which allows the moment of presence, which allows you to feel allows the body and the mind to understand what it needs now mm-hmm. in order to become better. And, and that better is always what is better. It's going to be based on a person per person basis, right? Like you're dealing with people that have had a wonderful childhood. You're dealing with people that have had, you know, traumatized childhoods, whatever, maybe different car accidents, whatever it is. Right. So we never know who's coming in or who's listening to this. You need to understand that the body has a great way of communicating to the brain that we've conditioned to shut off that mechanism and we've chosen passive ways of displacing the the physical pain. Mm -hmm. So you hurt your back doing deadlifts and you keep going, right? So you do passive stretching and chiropractor, acupuncture, myofascial releases, trigger points, whatever it may be, be, you're creating false sense of safety Mm -hmm. because you've released the inflammation and you've told the body, hey, listen, we're good to go. It's good to go if there's no stress in the environment, but guess what you're going to do because you've already started deadlifting. You're going to go back and now you're going to try 105 pounds. So the body learns to react. And then eventually goes, the body goes, well, fuck, he's not going to listen. So that number seven intensity goes down to a four because you're not going to listen. So we need to numb it down because we need to survive in this world. As we start to survive in this world, what do we do? We numb down what starts to hurt until eventually becomes non-existent, but then you push the stress enough and the body goes, whoa, please stop, right? And then that's where usually the physiotherapist will tell you all the symptoms that you have, but never truly provide a solution. Mm. So the same recurring injuries keep happening every six weeks, every four weeks, every three weeks. And then either you quit your sport, you take the stressor away, or you pop something, you, 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 tr- you pop the supraspinatus, you pop the pec major, you break at the spine somewhere, you have a slap tear at the femur, whatever it may be. And then everybody professional that you've been seeing goes, well, we told you to stop doing what you were doing. It's your fault. No, you were just moving incorrectly and not choosing to listen to the body. You chose to take four steps back, build the neural capacity, the safety of the glute max or the pec major, or the lat dorsi or whatever it may be then build the muscle quality, the confidence of it, and then build the mobility again and the confidence to handle load. Mm. So again, it all, they're all feedback loops and they can come from the psychological side, the physiological side or the environmental side. And they're all all just playing. Okay. And then is, is there, I was kind of talking about this recently uh, with, with Ansema of all people, but the, um, do you think that there's, For, for like, let's uh, say so young, young kids are like this, you know, 16 or 50, 15 to 25 in a sense, where it's like, there's, there's a time when you kind of, it would seem you just need to get the volume in and you just need to get the reps of like developing any type of, you know, when you're first learning how to juggle a soccer ball, you just need to like fail 10,000 times, you know, you just need to kind of like, there's a time for the five by five, go in and do that stuff. It, meaning before the brain's fully formed and you have this awareness, it's like, it, it, it would seem very difficult to have, right? Well, I guess the problem is I'm, the question is juxtaposing that there is a difference between. But the five by five doesn't need to be with a barbell back squat. That's a sports specific yeah. exercise. So okay, what so if we build the safety and the confidence through sandbag carries, through, through sled sprints, through moving real world objects. Mm-hmm. And then we have the safety, the neural capacity, the proper mobility under heavy load. And then we can add in the back squat. It's much easier. So meaning I can build the structural strength to make me better at a sports specific skill. I cannot build the skill enough to make me better at a structural movement. So I I had this, I had this, uh, we were doing a sandbag at a trade show. We had a dude that could deadlift like 800 pounds and he could not pick up a 240 pound sandbag. Mm 
does that tell you there's wow. a structural issue? Mm -hmm. That means that the barbell deadlift is extremely sports specific and people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. If you want to think about being functional, you want to pick up a body is not a barbell. So if you want to think about functional, you'd rather pick up something heavy like a sandbag that's dead weight that's in between your hands, not a barbell that is perfectly measured and outlined. But again, if you go back to the history, we're all using barbells because CrossFit started this revolution and it's much easier for a gym owner to have a barbell that could be, you know, micro, micro loaded and such than to have the same dumbbells, you know, 10, 10 of each dumbbell is going to get very expensive and take up space. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, we're, we're, we're moving in fads through fitness based on what's easiest and what's, like you said, what's a simple way everybody should be doing squats. Cool. It shouldn't be barbell squats, but it's easier to do barbell squats because everybody can microload it. We have, you know, a squat rack with 10 squat racks rather than having, you know, 10 sandbags that are the same weight or whatever it may be, right? So at the end of the day, when we look at fitness, it always ends up going to what's easiest for the person that's capitalizing on it. And, and you know, there's a niche group market that is looking for what is to be done so it can be done correctly. But for the most part, it's what's easiest. And then that becomes a big thing. And that's what starts to get pushed out. But when you're I looking see. at, sorry, like to go no, back to, to like those high school students, right? Like, why can't we build the structural strength with structural objects, right? Mm -hmm. Like I used to have Marines and, and high school kids that would come in. I would build structural strength with using med balls, with using sandbags, with using sleds that's way more beneficial than, than having to learn the skill of the barbell back squat. But what sells is the barbell back squat and, and being able to do a power clean with the, with the barbell. Yeah. I see the error of my question was the underlying framework that was the underlying miscalculation that we are literally almost all of strength training is sports specific training in disguise as fitness. Um, right. And if you were, to take that same intensity i guess what i was getting at is there a time for intensity where like intensity uh, the, the issue is before you are 25 and you have this like prefrontal cortex connectivity where you can be aware of all this stuff and have let's like, say a full integration like yes you're going to just do more intensity but an intensity if channeled into optimal like structural pathways you're going to develop in functional balance meaning if I take that intensity and say, you know, it's a 16 year old boy that's like, you know, half there, it's like, go pick up the sandbag, carry the sled, push the thing, climb the rope. It's like, you like, do the thing that has a real world correlation. Your body will figure out the rest. Now just go work hard. And like, I guess what I'm getting at is like, we're looking, we, this conversation I could easily be biased towards like, Oh, we're talking to people who are like so obsessed and they, they've worked themselves into the, cause this is the, the quintessential the dilemma of the high achiever is like, it's easy to be 30, 40, 50, having achieved great things. And like the, you know, Mark Bell, for example, is right. now working like un, undo his body, but it's like, he, he, it's, if someone just saw him today and said, Oh, well, Mark runs and does stuff. That's how he squat out house of pounds. It's like, like, the the single minded myopic focus of I'm only going to do this at all cost is what gets you to that greatness a level right. in a sense and but it seems like people are it's all one message it's all like relax and massage and release or it's all focus 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 it's like why do we right. have, to have both and I I guess my what I'm what I'm picking up from you is the if you take if your version of, of, of intensity is le seen through the lens of a specific sport you will ultimately end up warped. But if your version of intensity is an integrated structural output, then you will end up together. Like there's no reason that being intense means you have to beat yourself up. Right, 100%. I mean, it's, it, the, well, the, it, I feel like intensity is misconstrued now with, you know, there needs to be hard workouts, right? So the, 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 the intensity is gonna come from the neural output of the muscle. Mm -hmm. So would you want to have the intensity? Let's, you know, for example, we're going to do a burnout session of bench press. Would I want to have the burnout session of the bench press and the failing of me on the bench press because my pecs can no longer press or because my neck is hurting so much from displacing tension in the pec and going to the trap, right? Yeah. So when you're 15, 14, like, you know, especially in the U.S. because sports are so big, the, again, going back to capitalization, what's going to sell? If I can sound very smart, 
if I can do very sport specific work that's going to make me better at my sport, even if it causes injuries. So like you look at the injury rate of any high school football player or, you know what I mean? Like the amount of great athletes that never made it because they were put through shit training sucks when it's so simple that we can make them push by, you know, doing sled sprints, heavy sled drags, doing sandbag carries, doing very simple functional exercise, actual functional exercises that will naturally build the neural output of the muscles that then can then be transferred over to the skill of playing football. Like Mark Bell's well, where he's at, outside of a shit ton of work, he's also extremely gifted, right? Like mm -hmm. you could say that he's not and he's paying a lot of attention. He works very hard 100%, but it's not that he works very hard. It's that he presently and actively works very hard. He actively wants to get better. Yeah. He's not bringing in the best specialist and going like, oh, he's going to make me better. No, he's bringing in the best specialist and he's listening and applying and trying and trying and trying. Like you watch the videos. I love watching videos of people like Mark Bell because I can go back. Like right now I'm watching The Rock and I can see the left lat is turning off completely, which for mm -hmm. me is like he's lacking some self-confidence towards himself. Um, another question. But, so, but you, you can see it. Like if you go back to even like March, and you're watching him press, the lat stays engaged. And now at the last couple of videos I, I shared with my mentoring program, you see him and the lats, if, as you see on the, on the eccentric, the lat turns off and he's starting to go towards the neck. So, you know, that's the difference is that people are actively trying to get better or not. And so remember how we talked about stress, right? So as soon as you acquire enough skill, the body's trying to conserve energy because it's like, I'm not gonna spend energy trying to do this skill that I'm already at. So when people start to develop skill, they develop enough skill to not have to be there presently. So again, mm -hmm. going back to the reactive part of the muscle spindle cell, if you want to be active in it, now you're being forced to try and find new ways to find more intensity out of the muscle. That's what gears the change. So it's not that you have shitty genetics and your pecs don't grow, is that you've been doing all of the exercises reactively or passively you've you haven't gone to do an exercise trying to get a pec pump you've gone mm -hmm. to do the exercises hoping the pecs grow there's a difference you follow programs for the exercise or healthy shoulders without ever actually saying hey i just need to get the pecs to fire mm -hmm. even if it means that i'm going to start with five pounds holding here and moving here, because that's my range of motion. Or for you, it was like here. So have you actually tried grabbing a dumbbell and just squeeze or grabbing a med ball and just pressing to here? I guarantee I'll give you, you'll get a pec bump within two minutes. And yeah, it'll be so fucking that. intense. I was playing with that, so, uh, uh, squeezing the ball and lifting up. And I was like, there was, it was, there's a lot there, a lot to explore. Yeah, so that's the key is, like when you're looking at these gung-ho kids, Again, social media, thanks to social media, they want to do what's cool and what's vibing, but you're going to see the real true athletes, right? Which is what, 0.01%. Those are the ones that will do the work. Like, we, if I, I, like I've worked with some fighters and I've worked with some, you know, higher end athletes. I know who's going to make it and who's not. Mm -hmm. And the, the, that's because there's people that are doing things because it's either A, expected of them or because mm -hmm. they're naturally gifted or they're, they're, they're naturally gifted and they think, oh, this is going to help me or this is what's cool. And there's people like Mark Bell, dude, like that dude like doesn't give a fuck. And he's actively constantly trying to get better. That's the difference. People don't understand that about Mark. And he's told this to me many times. It's like, he's like, I've never done a hard lift in my like He like meaning he just he he's 100% like he's a, in alignment and knows where he's at. But he doesn't bring this like unnecessary like buzzing of stress with him. He's just Right. It's very, very, very. Di and I think that's the hardest part about the social media is all you see is the extra out, out, out external presentation. And people happen to find like I was thinking of the dating thing. It's like if you're you, you're a kid and teenager and like you're attracted to the person who seems to demonstrate the thing that you're la that you lack. Like if I'm quiet and extroverted because I'm just a little more like, you know, insecure, I'm going to be attracted to the person that's like out there and like obviously you know charismatic and, and talkative and it's like but then you find out you start dating them you find out like oh they're just oblivious and like this is just the natural <laughs> byproduct of their like shitty personality and you're quiet because you're really insecure and that's when they're like oh actually I did. like the thing that was the thing that you did as a byproduct of your toxic trait so to speak is the thing yeah. that like other people are attracted to but they don't realize that like you didn't choose that it's like you know it's more it's, of a um 
it's a learned behavior. It's a reactive yeah. behavior. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the cool part is like, again, I think that there's so much more information that's being held in muscle fibers and the quality of muscle and how muscles mm -hmm. are, how muscles show on people. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's been kind of my craft, right? So we can take somebody that's an introvert or not feeling secure about themselves and actually build confidence by yes. giving them the right program. So it's, that's the, the scary part of this is like you, can, you're, you have the capacity to do behavior modification. But if you look at all sports, they're all behavior modifications. Yeah. Like if you look at the 95, you know, 85, let's look at the belt curve, right? At 80%, 85%. Of all rugby players, they all have the same personality traits. All crossfitters, same personality traits. All runners, marathon runners, same personality traits. All triathletes and so on and so forth. They they start to again create this the the same behavioral trait, or this the behavioral trait makes them good at that sport, which is interesting. And then you start to look at the injuries, and they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a for me it's always an interesting correlation to 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 put into perspective it's like people that train the same will have the same patterns of injury or discomfort or pain but they also start to have the same behavioral traits yeah and which came and, first the injury or the personality trait <laughs> yeah and you could say it's like it's environmental and it kind of is of sorts right but again it's all it's all related you can't fragment it's just environmental it's also physiological and it's also psychological they mm -hmm. all play in tune together dude i forgot Forgot. I have a I have a uh, no, this mentoring call, I, so I'm gonna have to get no, going that, here soon. Uh, uh, that's, <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna roll things down anyway. Like, so time um, goes by too fast. Yeah, I, I'm gonna uh, try and I'm gonna go to jujitsu with the intention of not uh, not dying. Uh, with, but like, there's so many things it's, it's learning. So uh, just just to, to wrap this up, because I mean, it's one of those like continuing conversations where there's just so much to explore. But um, if this had, if you're in the United States or any of the accompanying I don't know, America portions. Yeah. Um, Richard's going to be out, out in Sacramento in the beginning of December. Did you uh, reach out to um, David Weck and talk about anything? I talked anything, anything to him. That? Yeah, he said he was um, coming up on December. He said he might come up to the workshop or we'll go, he'll, he'll host a workshop in San Diego. Perfect, and he, good. Yeah, I literally so. saw him. I was like, you've got to. So anyways, <laughs> he's, he's a phenomenal guy, but. Um, so you'll be in California and it'll be just it, like there we'll be doing, um, I think two different workshops. Do you want to kind of do a quick little yeah. overview of that? So we kind of made it, I made it a weekend workshop just because I, you told me to set something up and then I got really excited as I did right now. <laughs> so basically I'm going to be breaking down everything of how we store behavioral traits and emotions in our muscles. Um, but more than just giving you guys information, cause I think that that's always very easy to do. It's more about creating experiences. So that's what's mm -hmm. going to take most of the bulk is making sure you guys can have an experience, whoever joins us, to understand how we can change our perception of our world around us and internally through proper movement and proper engagement of the muscles. Excellent. Good. Um, I'll put a link to that uh, sign up for that seminar attached to this in both the podcast and the live version. Um, we'll continue to. to pitch about it um, i'll be there as a uh, willing participant to learn from richard so Beautiful. thank you so much for your time this has been this is just so good so good i yeah. just I've got so much to think about <laughs> appreciate you beautiful all right man take all care right. thank Thanks you sir. so much bye all right. bye